Well, let me encourage all of you to, uh, as we can go through this time of the, studying the Bible, is that, uh, you know, the Bible is relevant for today. Bible doctrine is relevant for today. It's understanding who God is, what He has done, what He is doing will help you with your daily things in life. I try to, in my teaching and preaching, to share with you how those things happen, how it relates to your daily life. Uh, I remember I served in one church that the pastor was pretty boring. I mean, he really was. He really, I mean, he didn't just give you a meal. I mean, he basically, he gave you two or three restaurant buffets at one time and about overwhelmed you. I'd have to just stop paying attention to everything and focus on one thing. That was maybe a flaw in his preaching, but I look back now and I said, well, praise the Lord. He was giving us the word. Giving us more, and you know, people were criticizing him because he was not very animated. He was a little dry, but uh, church was growing. We were baptizing people, reaching folks, but he didn't have the pizzazz. And you know, I left, and a few years later, he left. He, uh, you know, a lot of times we don't understand. Sometimes we, you know, like like in watching sports, sometimes we don't understand what we've got till we we fire a coach or do something like, wow, you know, we had never been as good as we were when we had that person, you know. We have to be careful about wanting to get rid of things and get rid of people, and um, and, and so this is what it, you know. This is why we need to thank God for whatever He gives us, and, and God has given us a lot here as a congregation. We were talking about that in Sunday school. We need to cherish it. Uh, we need to be ourselves, and at the same time, we need to keep trying to grow and be the best selves we can be. You know, God made us with our unique personalities and talents, and and we need to not be ashamed to use that, and yet at the same time, keep growing. I served in a church that had a sort of what we call uh, theologically a Reformed Baptist flavor. And we had a statement that said we are Reformed and we are always reforming. So that means that, you know, and this is where some people struggle to say, well, I remember 30 years ago we did it that way. Why are we moving a little differently? Well, because we got to know God's Word a little better and said, ah, we, we can fine-tune that a little bit. We can be a little more effective in reaching people for the Lord. Or God wasn't angry with us when we had that amount of knowledge, but he showed us that, oh, we should probably take this element of the church life a little more seriously, so we need to do it. And so, you know, so I know a lot of people want to just plug into a formula and go with it, but that's not, I, I've seen so many people just want to, even a pastor or a deacon or a Sunday school teacher, just tell me what to do. You know, freedom's hard. It really is. You know, we have some people in our church that are, you know, protesting some of the, the tax things that are happening here, and I don't have a problem with that. I'm glad some of them have done that. Uh, I think it's it's good that as a Christians they've taken leadership, and I was impressed that the, the political action committee even said some uh, complimentary things about their opponent. Said we totally disagree with their viewpoint, but we don't want to attack them personally. And I thought that was very good that they did that, and yet they stood their ground. Uh, it's a lot easier just to let somebody else run it for you. You start trying to be a free people politically, that's hard work. If you want to grow in the Lord, I mean, I think sometimes there's been abuse and things that's happened in churches because people have just said, well, I'm so busy, I'm just going to let this person handle it. And It's okay to ask questions. It's okay to uh, want to hold people accountable. Now, don't be a jerk about it, but you know, it's okay to hold people accountable. And I think if we, and it's hard work. It's a lot easier just to sit back and plug into a formula and go with it. I remember serving with a pastor that wanted to start a prayer ministry, a men's prayer ministry. It was a good thing he wanted to do. We were in Mississippi at the time. He brought uh, somebody from Jackson, Mississippi, one of the state Baptist people, to come in and try to help us set that up, this, this fancy program. And I thought, you know, we've got some guys here that if you just have some coffee and some donuts and ask them to come here and pray, they do it. You know, and then you give a little direction, and then from there maybe the next place would be to call the consultant. But this guy was always trying to plug into a program, and this doesn't work that way, does it? It just doesn't. So uh, we need organization. But, so I just want to encourage y'all to keep growing in the Lord. God is doing great things in our midst. Uh, let's look today at grace, the better covenant. We looked last week at, a, I don't know what I'm doing over here in Ezekiel. That's a long ways away from where I'm supposed to be. <laughs> okay, that's in the wrong testament. Here we go. Now I'm here. Hebrews chapter 12. I want to just, um, and we're going to read the passage of scripture here in just a moment. Uh, but I want to, uh, before I get ready to read it, let me just say that today's scripture passage, we're going to be presented with a contrast between two covenants. And if you're not familiar with what a covenant is, let me tell you what that is. When you got married, you had made a covenant with one another. Um, except I did do a marriage the other, other week for somebody, and she, bride didn't really tell me what she wanted, and uh, so I just came up with a, I'm always going to share the gospel, but I came up with a typical thing, got to the vows. You're like, we're not doing that. I'm like, okay, whatever, you know, that's, all right, 
right, okay, we want to do them. Okay, we didn't rehearse this thing, you know. But, but really, we make vows. We make, we make agreements as to what we're going to do, conditions and how we respond and promises. And there's agreement about how each side will treat each other, these obligations and promises. But a biblical covenant differs from a regular covenant in that God dictates the terms of the covenant. God gets to do this because he's the creator. Okay? And it's not arrogance on the part of God. I want you to know that. It is actually an act of grace. As the creator, God does not have to communicate with us at all. He could be like the deists proposed, and the deists were people that they are still out there in the world. Many of the founding fathers of our nation, not all of them, there were some that were godly biblical Christians, but there were some who were deists. Uh, Benjamin Franklin was one of them. Uh, when people say, oh, you know, it's in the Bible. The Lord helps those who help themselves. No, that's Benjamin Franklin. That's not in the Bible. Uh, that doesn't mean these were bad guys. They did believe in a, in a, in a higher power and in, uh, in, in a God, but, but they just believed God created the world. He set its principles in order like a clockmaker. He made the clock. He wound it up. He let it go. He wasn't really active in our lives, but that's not the biblical God. Instead, God is actually gracious, gracious and he's merciful in that he condescends. He comes down to us and meets us to make a covenant. He meets with us. And he's obligated himself to certain promises and blessings that have nothing to do with us being able to dictate terms or make him do anything. We don't have any power to make God do anything, do we? That's right. But God has said, I lock myself in. I promise to do this for y'all. I'm going to do it. And so the fact that he in his holiness and majesty have made us these promises to make this covenant obligation he's put on himself more certain and sure should bless us. So I ask you, how do we know that God has spoken to us and made a covenant with us? Do you know? How do we know that? Because I'll tell you, how do you know that God's made a covenant? Yeah, there you go, Becky's holding up. The Word of God, we read that here, okay? And I realize you have to accept that the Bible is the Word of God by faith. To a point, I mean, you know, have every little, if you're one of those hardcore questioning people, not every little jot and tittle of, of, of concern is going to be totally settled in your mind. But we know from this Bible, God's holy word, and without this written revelation, we might see some things in creation and know some things about God. We certainly could. We might even have a feeling in our heart. God might speak to our heart, but the only problem with our heart is our hearts are still sinful, so the thing that God might reveal to us is good, but it would get messed up with other wrong ideas that we might hear or feel. I mean, do you, can you always trust your feelings? No, you better not. Mm. Okay, you really you better not do that. Don't always trust your feelings. Uh, don't do that. And so, we need the Word of God. We need a written Word, something, because sometimes you've got to go to the Word of God and stand on it and your feelings tell you something different. That you might not feel that Jesus loves you. But you've trusted in Him. You've trusted in His saving work. Well, that, He loves you. That's, that's a fact. And no matter how you feel about it, He does. Because it says in the Word of God. So, God has spoken. It's been recorded. Just as the financial agreements that you have between you and the bank are recorded, right? I know years ago we shook hands and that was it. But now we have all these documents. and there's, So we have proof. God gave us proof that He will do what He said He's going to do. So, we're going to look today between at two covenants. Law and grace. Of course... You already see the title. We see which one's a better covenant. Okay, we'll talk about that. The law had some elements of grace in it. It wasn't totally graceless. But the grace wasn't as evident, and it wasn't able to be seen as well. And we're going to see today why the covenant of grace is superior to the covenant of the law, and why we should rejoice and shout whenever we sing the glorious hymn, Amazing Grace. Amen. How sweet the sound. So, so let's read the Word of God, and then we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. So beginning in verse 18 of Hebrews 12. We read here, for you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire in darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given. And here's, here's what that, here was that order. If even a beast touches a mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. 
Heavenly Father, we come to you and ask that you bless the reading of your word, that you would bless these hearers who hear in this room, those who hear on the internet, uh, those who, uh, as many as I preach, that I would hide me behind the cross and help me only to say what you would have me to say. Lord God, touch us today. Help us to hear and receive your word and go for it, Lord, to, to go out and obey it and live it and to rejoice in the gospel. Father, we pray for our nation, many people, especially our leaders who have strayed away from you. And we would pray that you would save them and that you would save the ones who are lost and give them a change of heart and help them to lead according to your holy standards. Uh, we pray that people will get dissatisfied with what humans can do and get so dissatisfied that they would cry out to you and accept your terms and conditions and receive your grace. We pray for the leaders of the Southern Baptist Convention who have a lot of turmoil right now going on in a lot of areas. And yet I believe this turmoil has been brought about by you to ultimately fix things and get them where they ought to be. So, so give them wisdom and leadership in Nashville to the executive committee and, and uh, to our messengers, our, our, our people, the, the, the common people who meet every year and, and vote on things at the convention. Give wisdom to Brother David Williams right here in our association who has done a great work of training other ministers, other people, and is trying to reach this county for you through our Baptist churches. We even have uh, a young man here today that you have used the training to help our church and benefit us, and we thank you for that. Lord, today, move in power. Do what needs to be done in our lives, whether it's salvation for lost people, whether it's encouragement, building up, repentance, whatever is needed today, do it but help us to leave here rejoicing in the gospel and in your grace. I pray and ask this in Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. So we want to look at the two covenants. I just have two main points. And uh, the first one is the terror of the law. The terror of the law. And we see in this passage, you start with verse 18 here, we see the physical manifestation of God's divine holiness. You see that there's the fire, darkness, storm, that tempest it mentions in maybe some of your translations. The sound of a trumpet. The sound of a trumpet can be nice. I mean, I hear a trumpet. I have a, have a lot of records by the late uh, Al Hurt, you know, and uh, I always liked his trumpet playing. I really did. You know, I got a ton of records by him, you know. Y'all come to the house one day, we'll hook them up and we'll, we'll drink some coffee and hang out and visit and listen to Al Hurt, you know, and enjoy that. And, uh, that would be relaxing. How is playing is not terrifying, you know. Uh, but it can be terrifying when it's, it's blown to announce some kind of big announcement or to, uh, you know, da, 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 maybe it's the king is coming and if you're on the wrong side of the king, uh, that could be bad, you know. So, um, you know, like I said, we had that. We had God's voice that terrified the people, you know. And God's voice can be comforting at times, but God's voice can be terrifying. God and his holiness. And these people were commanded, these Israelites, and you go back to Exodus 19 and look this up where this happened, they were commanded not to touch the mountain. We read that any animal that touched the mountain was to be put to death. Either stoned or shot through with arrow, but they were to be put to death because God was on that mountain and they weren't to touch it. Because God is... Why was that? What's the attribute about God wouldn't allow them to do that? God is holy. holy. That's right, he's holy. And he's not to be trifled with. And so I will tell you, all of us, that God's holiness should terrify us. Now, we'll talk about later what it means to be in Christ and how we don't have to live in, in terror. We can live in a reverent fear. But, you know, there's a lot of flippancy about God and spirituality around us, isn't it? Uh, I will say this, while there's joy in God's presence for the redeemed, and there is, and there should be, we should have joy we meet with God. I will say that some Christians in years past maybe were overly dour about some things. You know, it's okay to have joy. It's okay to tell some jokes. It's We get together in fellowship, maybe before church, after church, in our meal times and other places. There's a time to rejoice, to tell jokes. But I'm going to tell you, I think that a lot of what's gone wrong in America is we've had too many, and I mean many, many preachers telling jokes and other things and uh now, this pastor I told you that was somewhat boring, even Rick Warren, who helped grow Saddleback Church from about 10 people in his living room to where over a 10-year period they met in 79 different locations and finally built this huge 
church in California, this huge me- mega church. Rick even said in one of his books that uh, I think it's Purpose Driven Life that you learn anything from the most boring teachers they are teaching the truth. You know, and that, that, that's a guy that, that grew a big church, you know, but he was saying, hey, focus on what the gospel is. Focus on how you can grow. But we're living in a world today, if we're not careful, we can get too silly. And there's a time to be silly and to be funny and tell jokes. I, I love good, clean comedy. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, Mark Lowry can get very silly. And, uh, and I've had a time or two that I thought, Mark almost went a little too far there. You know, I mean, he got too, and it is, anybody can do that. You can get carried away with what you're doing. But I've read some of his things and heard some of the things he said. Mark can get pretty deep, really deep, really serious. So if, you know, if you're just always joking around and goofing off, hey, yeah, a lot of times that's a defense mechanism. It means I really feel inadequate or I don't feel comfortable. But there's, and it's okay to have some joy. But God's holiness, even as a Christian, there's an element that we should be in reverent fear of him, you know. Um, so that was the physical manifestation of God's holiness. And, 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 but then we also look at the covenant of law required obedience to the law. Now, I'm not telling you that grace doesn't have an element of obedience in it. It does too. But, but the covenant of law required obedience to the law. And I just want to tell you, that the law is good. The Apostle Paul said that in 1 Timothy 1.8. It's a good thing. But humans who are not indwelt with the Holy Spirit can't obey the law. They just can't. The intention of the law was not that God's going to put the Ten Commandments out here and we're going to obey them and we're going to go to heaven. That is, by the way, one way you can go to heaven. God gives the law. You obey every bit of it. You'll go to heaven. Mm-hmm. But nobody can do that because here's the thing. Jesus said it wasn't enough if you... you know, like I say, Let's say you may be... Uh, you, you know, she said, if you commit adultery, the Bible says, I shall not commit adultery in the Ten Commandments. But Jesus said, if you look on someone to lust after him, that's adultery. Uh, let's just say that we will, thou shalt not kill. I've never killed. You ever been mad enough you could kill somebody? I have. You're the pastor. Yeah, I have. There's been times, get me along with them and, you know, I'm all right. You know, throw them out there. I'll run over them in my car. You know, that's what. Well, you know, I mean, I never did that because I deep down knew that was wrong. And you know, part of this, I feared God. Okay? And I feared the police, and I didn't want to go to prison. And got a lot of things I feared. Some fear is good. It keeps us from doing bad things. And I calmed down and got past that. But, and, um, but yeah. So you see what I'm saying? But that's sin. I, in God's mind, I murdered that person. So, oops. There you go. And if you only committed one sin a day, just one little sin, one little white lie, and you did that and you lived to be even like 65 years old, I think you would have committed like 20 and some odd thousand sins. So that's just not an option. You're, you're not going to keep all the commandments. And God never really thought anybody could. They were given to us to show I can't do it. And that's why they went and sacrificed those lambs and those, those, those cattle and things. And uh, when they messed up, when they were aware of it, they went and offered one. But there was times they offered one because they, they, they knew they weren't. There were some sins that slipped by. And they had to constantly do that. I am so glad I'm not in that day and time that y'all mess up. You got to bring me a cow. I got to go slaughter it. I got to, oh, you know, I'd be like, oh no, not again. I got to offer more blood. Oh man, I was gonna rest. Now I got to kill this cow and cook it. And you know, I'm glad that we y'all can just go tell Jesus about it. Okay, I'm glad that you do that. But but in that day and time. You know, that's what the law was there. It was there to show us we can't obey it. And so the voice the Israelites heard on the mountain was so terrifying, they asked God not to speak to them directly anymore, but let Moses be that one to do it. And uh, uh, there's a guy, I'm trying to think of his first name now, but Buchanan is his name. I had taught one of his books, Your God is Too Safe. And uh, he made a statement that said, that, that request is a request of many pastor search committees. We don't want to talk to God or hear from him. You talk to him and tell us. Because it can be sort of terrifying and convicting to hear from the Lord. And by the way, it is my job to study the Word of God. Last two weeks, I've done a lot more study. Saturdays have been filled with, I'll confess, a little football on the TV in the background. But it's been trying to study this deeper and write it. And I have learned some things. And some things I had forgotten that I've been refreshed in. And it's been good. It's been a lot of deep study. But I do that because I do know you need to hear from God. And you do need to hear some things that you might not be picking up in your daily life. But these people were terrified. But, but here's what, on one hand, they're terrified. But it tells us in Exodus 19, 8, there's also the arrogance of the human heart. Because when God gave them some of these commands, they proclaimed they would obey everything God had spoken. They couldn't do it. 
But they said we will, but then on the other hand, don't let God talk to us anymore. Have Moses do it. So the purpose of the law is to show us we can't perfectly obey God. We need a new heart, which is, what was that doctrine we talked about in our first uh, Wednesday night study? Doctrine starts with an R. It's a uh, re... When you grow something back, what's that? Regeneration. We have this heart of stone. We need this heart of flesh. And that is in the Old Testament. That's what that grace is. Ezekiel 26, 36. Or is it 36, 26? It's one or the other. Okay. I don't have it in order. Uh, we need that new heart of flesh. So and then here's what we need to know. Even Moses trembled at the thought of drawing close to God under such terrifying conditions. So you see many people who'd say, oh, we just need to put the Ten Commandments out here and everybody obey them. I think it'd be good to still put the Ten Commandments out in courthouses and places because yeah. it'd be good to see them. Yes, it'd be good to hear them in school. I mean, sure. everybody's not going to perfectly obey them, but, you know, even partial obedience is better than no obedience. That's right. You know, I mean, it would help at least as far as the structure of our society. But I need to let you, as far as your own salvation, it, it, it can't save you. If it doesn't get you to the point, well, we've heard this maybe in evangelism class. Only way you help people get saved is got to help them see that they're lost first. You can't share it. Don't go sharing Jesus with people and tell them he's the answer. Just pray and be forgiven if they don't recognize they're even a sinner. You jump the gun. Don't offer them. I mean, you know, it's like giving medicine to somebody's not sick. You know, they don't realize they're sick. You know, no. You got to help them get lost. And if you'll go through the Ten Commandments and they're honest, they'll say, "Whoa, I've done that one." Well, now you can say you need Jesus. Jesus died. He lived the perfect life. He died to, to help you with that, uh, to, to pay that price because you've sinned against God. And I would like to say, too, as we, we move into our next point, and this is the really exciting point. This is the, you know, the, we haven't been on much shouting ground here yet, but for us to truly appreciate God's grace, we must first be terrified of His holiness. He was, you know, Moses was terrified to think that he could stand before God on, a, on the basis of a human's own legal righteousness. I've quoted this passage many times, Isaiah 64, 6, where the prophet Isaiah said, all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And if you get into the literal thing, garments of menstruation, bloody. Right? We think, oh, it's just got more dust on it. No. And I've worked in a medical group, folks. Bloody, bloody, sticky. It stinks. I've had to clean it up. I worked in a medical group for nine years. It's nasty. And your righteousness is that you, the good things you try to do in your own power stink to God. You say, well, that hurts my feelings. I was trying to do something good. If you don't do it in the power of the Holy Spirit, letting Jesus motivate that, it just becomes one of the Bible tells us in the book of Corinthians. One of the Corinthians, I can't tell you which. Uh, when it is, it's the first or second one. But that there's going to be times that we're going to be judged at the end. And some of the things we've done, the things we've done for the gospel and the power of Christ, are going to stand and we'll get rewarded for that. It's going to be a lot of good things, a lot of good sermons I've preached, a lot of songs I've sung. They don't count. They're going to get burned up because I did them to say, look at me, you know. I've done that. Uh, I have to say God took that out of me. I, I, I don't think I do that now. But I used to when I first started singing. Look at me. I want to be noticed. And now I'm like, hey, you know, if you need me to sing, I'll sing. If you don't, well, I'm, I'm going to sing back up. You know, I'm just as happy to sing back up for somebody as I am to be the lead singer. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a terrible lead singer in the group because I want to sing harmony all the time. You know? So I'm a terrible lead singer. So I don't have enough, you know. And, and it is. It's a wonderful feeling when you get to that place, isn't it, Charles? But, uh, that we just say, man, I just want to be part of the group. And I just want to worship and want to blend in. But uh, that's why that's why a lot of churches, you know, the devil will get into the music program and tear the place up because we, um, you know, we just we got to understand why we do what we do. So let me get to the second point here, and uh, this is a great one. We have the terror of the law, but now let's look at the joy and confidence of the covenant of grace. So here we go. We're gonna run through these points pretty fast because there's a lot of good ones to tell. I'm not gonna linger too long on any of them. But number one, we have already, if you're in Christ now, we have already come to Mount Zion in the city of the living God. You begin to see that in verse 22. It says you've come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God. Yeah, that was real creative. I just took that right out of the Bible, didn't I? Okay, so we're already, it says in Ephesians 2, 6, we are already seated in the heavens with Christ. Now you say, well, I'm not in heaven right now. I'm here at Central Baptist Church. I'm in this little building over here in the county seat of Liberty County in Liberty, Texas. I'm not up there with Christ. Yeah, you are. 
positionally, as far as God's concerned, you're already up there with him. Okay? You're seated up there. That's, that's your right. You've come there. And so the joy we have in knowing Jesus is just a foretaste of the everlasting joy we're going to have in the, the new kingdom. Amen. We, we're in the city of God, and we're, we're in the palace of God, even that's right, right. now. And then we move on to the next thing. It says, we have come to the celebration gathering of an innumerable number of angels. We can't even, you know, now again, when I've had a day that I hadn't had to run to Beaumont or Baytown right away since they, uh, man, they messed around and put the Me TV on a channel I can't pick up real good anymore. I'd have to go outside and finagle the antenna for 15 minutes. So I started watching Start TV and started watching Touch by an Angel, you know. And there's some good things in Touch by an Angel. The biggest thing that they messed up in is that they don't talk to anything about Jesus, you know. But as a Christian, I'm watching that and I'm getting encouraged, you know, because I say, well, I know it's really in Jesus. It's in Christ. And, uh, and by the way, when that show was on, I hope you use it as a jumping off point to talk to people about Jesus because uh, I believe there was still some good that came out of it. But these angels here are elect angels, and they, 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 they delight to do God's will. You see, when, when Satan led the angels to rebel, they didn't get a second chance. God said, you went with Satan? That's it. Forever condemned. You know, some of them are in chains of darkness now. Others are demons that are running around doing their thing. Can't repent. Doesn't matter. God's done with them. Here's the thing. God could have done that with Adam and Eve and said, I'm done with y'all. You rebelled against me. Boop, you're gone. I love what happened when a guy asked R.C. Sproul about was God not a little harsh? Uh, you know, and how he dealt with Adam and Eve and moving them out of the garden and and R.C. explained, look, God created them. He gave them all this wonderful thing. He gave them this one little thing they weren't supposed to do, but everything else was wonderful. And they didn't keep that. They rebelled against him. He said, it's not harsh. He had actually, it was, it was a, a meme, a little video that was on uh, Facebook there for many years. What's wrong with you people? That's just what Dr. Spruill said. What's wrong with you people? I mean, that God's being harsh? No, he's not. He's God, and he, he told you this one thing not to do, and you did it. It's not harsh or mean. That's what this holy God was rebelled against. But the good thing is that um, we get grace. The angels learn a lot from us. They're learning the will of God right now by observing his dealings with each one of you. That y'all have blown it, haven't you? Yes, sir. And he had kicked you out. And yet he sent Jesus to die for your sins. And he's, the angels are learning things right now about you. And you right now have fellowship when well, you come to the celebration, when you got saved and you surrendered to Jesus, the angels of heaven had a party. They got excited. They were like, "Woo!" They got excited. You know, Bo got saved today. Bentley got saved. Sam got saved. Robbie got saved. Woo! They had a good time. <laughs> you know, I ain't had too many people cheer for me a lot, except sometimes when I sing, they cheered. Mm -hmm. Athletically, I've always had this great athletic dream. And Bentley's had those moments where he... He got on fire last year in one game and, and hit 18 points. If he hadn't had that leg cramp, I think he was going to go for 30 maybe. Where he, uh, anyway, but I had one moment in intramural ball that I actually, our team got whipped like 73-20. I don't even know if Jennifer was at that game, but it was our little group of preachers got whooped by the baseball players. But I actually scored like I think six out of the first eight points that we scored. And people started cheering for me, you know, because I was they didn't think this old awkward, I wasn't big like him now. They didn't think this little awkward guy was gonna do anything. But I had people cheering, it was a good feeling. Hey, when you got saved, the angels of heaven going, Woo, you got saved. You surrendered to Jesus. How awesome. Amen. And you're part of that celebration. So I could say more about that, but I've got to move on, but. It also says, we have come to the assembly of the firstborn. So, look, I, there's so much I could say about this, but I'm just going to share with you what the Reformation Study Bible says about this. All the firstborn in Israel were sanctified at the time of the Passover and consecrated to service in God's presence. But the Levites served the sanctuary in place of the firstborn. You can go to Numbers chapter 3 and see that. So, in other words, there was a tax that the firstborn had to pay, but the Levites were set aside. That's why they didn't get a a plot of land. They did get some cities, but they didn't get a tribe because they were serving in place of the firstborn of Israel. Okay, and as a firstborn, that hits me because uh, technically the firstborn was supposed to be sacrificed, but God said, we're not going to kill the firstborn of the humans here. We're just going to have you pay the tax and the Levites are going to stand in their place. 
But in the heavenly assembly, all believers redeemed from destruction are firstborn. said, so I am actually a firstborn. But Bentley is not a firstborn. He's a secondborn. Sam is a firstborn, but she's also a youngborn. But she's still the firstborn, you know. I don't think Bo is a firstborn. Oh, you know, you got an older sister, okay? Genebeth is definitely, she's the baby. She's not a firstborn, okay? My wife is a firstborn. So yeah, how does that work out? Two firstborn married each other. Well, it, it's, there's a moment, so I tell you, that's, a, that's right. So, but yeah, the firstborn. So, but guess what? We didn't have to be, um, in, in the heavenly assembly, all believers are firstborn. We're consecrated to God, and we're all enrolled as, as his priests. Yes, sir. That's right, we all are. The priesthood of the believers, unlike Esau, and we talked about him last week, Esau, who scorned his right as the firstborn, believers gratefully share in the inheritance of Jesus, the firstborn. See, Jesus is the firstborn. He's God's only son, and he's the firstborn. And in the heavenly assembly, all believers may worship in heaven and on earth. So we've come to the assembly of the firstborn. We all get the rights and privileges and blessings of the firstborn. And as a firstborn, I did get some blessings. My dad actually bought my old used car. My middle brother saved up his money and bought his own. So I think my middle brother came out better on that because he got one that got 20-something miles per gallon. I got one that got 10. So, you know, I eventually sold it because <laughs> I couldn't afford to operate it. But anyway, but yeah, there's benefits. To, and so we have this glorious standing in the covenant of grace. But look, we also have come to God, the judge of all. Now, does that sound immediately coming to a judge? Does that sound joyful in itself? I mean, if I were to come before the judge in our county, would that necessarily, if I was guilty of something, that wouldn't necessarily be exciting, would it? But we get to get excited about coming to the judge because there's now no separating veil, no cloud of darkness hiding his face from us. There's no rumbling sound where he's behind the... Uh, the cloud speaking, no terrifying sound because we hear him and see him through Jesus. Jesus is the visible manifestation of God and we have seen him and it's because of justification that we talked about that last week on Wednesday night, didn't we? Because of justification, we stand before God in his holy presence knowing that because of Jesus' sacrifice for us and by the way, and for God the Father, the sin question has been settled forever, and God's perfect love has cast out all fear. At some point, I'll talk to you about how Jesus also died for God the Father. I don't know if that makes sense to you, but it does. Jesus didn't just die for us. The Father was holy. Something had to be done. And Jesus died to satisfy his anger against our sin. And that's why the Father accepts us in Christ. As my friend Sarah Beth Gohagen wrote a song some years ago on her album, Tired of Singing Sad Songs. I can't remember the name of the song, but she had a phrase where she said, the Father is seeing us through the holy filter of Jesus. The Father puts on his Jesus glasses and sees us as perfect. Okay? He looks at you. Y'all know you're not perfect. But the Father sees you that way because he's looking at you through the lens of Jesus and he shed blood. And I could say more about that, but we're getting out of time. So, Point E, we have come to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. These are those who have died in the Lord or under the covenant of the law. This is Moses and Abraham that we talked about this morning in Sunday school. Sarah, later Isaac. This is King David. They had been saved on credit. Yeah, they'd been saved on credit. Waiting for Jesus to pay the price for their redemption when he died and rose from the dead. And we read that Jesus was slain from the, the foundation of the world. We read that because guess what? If you go to Numbers, I think it is chapter 21, you will see where the Israelites were doing some gross immorality. They were in problems, but when uh, Balaam was brought out to curse them, he ends up by the Spirit of God giving a blessing. And the reason for that, I've preached a sermon on this many times, what God does not see. God was looking ahead some 4,000 years to the cross. And said, they're perfect. They weren't perfect. They had just done some really bad things. But he, it was a sure fact that Jesus was going to die. Satan wasn't going to stop it. He was going to try. Well, actually, I don't think Satan fully understood what was going on. Or he might have tried a little, a little harder than he did. Uh, he wouldn't have put him to death. Man, there's so much more I could say there. But we have come to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. See, Moses was an imperfect mediator. I mean... He didn't get to go to the promised lands. He got torqued off with the people of Israel. And I say as a pastor, I've gotten mad and frustrated with the people that I've served under. 
They irritated me at times, and some have been outright mean to me, and I haven't always reacted right. And Moses didn't. He got mad, struck the rock when he was supposed to speak to it, basically said, i got to bring water out here for you. Well, Moses wasn't bringing any water out. He was doing it. The things he was doing, he was doing it through the power of God. And God said, you ain't going to the promised land. And God was serious about that. So Moses was an imperfect mediator, as great as he was, one of the meekest men on the face of the earth. But Jesus is a perfect mediator. Go to 1 John 2, 1, and you'll see that. The advocate that we have. I talk about it all the time. Jesus was the perfect God-man. His humanity was necessary so that he could live that perfect life as a human and represent us before God and die in our place. And yet his divinity gives us access to God the Father. He bridges that gap between us and God. Boy, I mean, isn't our, have I got to say any more to convince y'all that the covenant of grace is better? Are y'all convinced? Yes, sir. Okay, but guess what? I got one more, Okay. <laughs> We have come to Jesus' sprinkled blood. The fact that the blood is sprinkled lets us know that it is able to be divided into the smallest portions and reach even the least of us. I don't have a cup here, but let's say I had a cup and I was right, full of water. I would have to have a lot of water to just slosh it out to get all of y'all. But if I had a cup here, I could just put my fingers in it and get the front row here. And probably that cup would last all throughout this building, wouldn't it? But if I were to just take it and slosh it on you, I'd run out of it real quickly. Sprinkling can get to each one. It can be an individual thing. Are you hearing me there? Yes, it gets to you. It gets to the least of us. It can be divided into smallest proportions and reach even the least of us. And this blood is better than Abel's blood under the old covenant. Abel's blood cried for vengeance. It said, Cain has killed me. There has to be avenged. You know, this eye for an eye. I want to tell you something. The eye for an eye was actually a gracious thing. It meant that if somebody came up, like, you know, cut off your kid's leg, you couldn't, like, you know, you couldn't stab him through the heart and kill him. You could, you could kill him, you could take his leg, that's all you could take. You know, somebody put your eye out, you could put the eye out. You weren't to do anything more. Didn't mean you had to, but it means you could. You, you, it, was, it was a restraining thing. So there was still vengeance in the law. But God's got more than that. He's got grace. He's got mercy. He's got, Abel's blood cries out for vengeance. Jesus' blood cries out forgiveness for the children of God. He keeps crying out, forgive them, forgive them, forgive them. And so even the most feeble of all believers now is able to stand before God and enter this wonderful realm of blessing. I like what Martin Luther said. And this is why I emphasize the gospel as much as I do. It's not just for lost people. It's for us every week. I must listen to the gospel. It tells me not what I must do, but what Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has done for me. Amen. So let me conclude with this. As Lorinda and Charles come forward, that I'm going to share with you what Alexander McLaren said at the end of one of his sermons on this passage. He preached about four on this passage. I, I've summed it all up into one. Let me just share what he said. He that comes to Christ is in the city. He that comes to Christ is, not will be, in the palace. He that comes to Christ is in the presence of the judge. He that comes to Christ touches angels and perfected spirits and is knit to all that are knit to the same Lord. He that comes to Christ comes to cleansing and enters into the fullness of the promise and lives in the presence and companionship of his present absent Lord. Christ is present in our hearts and lives, but he hadn't physically come back yet. So that's what that's talking about. If we come to Jesus by faith, and here's what I want to hear, whether you're listening by the internet, whether you're here today, if we come to Jesus by faith, Jesus will come at last to us to receive him to himself and join us to the choirs of the perfected spirits who have, as it says in the book of Revelation, washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So let's come to Jesus today in this covenant of grace. And whether you need salvation, or whether you need forgiveness,